do this, eh? Mm. Yeah, Dive right in, brother. So you're very much a outdoors person. You completely immerse yourself in the outdoor world. You do bushcraft as well. But a question I wanted just to start off and ask is, was there sort of a, a deeper sort of fundamental reason why you actually decided to explore the natural world and explore bushcraft? Um, I, I think there's a couple of motivations that are probably deeper than just the practical, can I do this? Can I make a fire? Can I, yeah. um, can I do that? I mean, one is that I always did we were talking just before we started recording and I'm happy to say it again, you know, a little bit of my origin story as it were. I mean, I grew up in the countryside. I was born in in Yorkshire and we moved to North Wales when I was five and I was very fortunate to grow up in part of Snowdonia, um, which is, you know, it's a beautiful national park area of, of North Wales and there's mountains there and there's a lot of forest. I mean, a lot of the forest is Forestry Commission forest, but we had this big... Forestry Commission yeah. Forest behind the house, and I just kind of grew up where it was normal, you know, as a sort of seven-year-old, if you're, you know, running around the woods all day. And so I think for me, being outdoors and just having the freedom to do stuff outdoors has always been quite normal. I mean, it's what I grew up with. And then I, when I was ten, we moved back to the northeast, um, and my parents moved to Teesdale, which is a different environment to North Wales, but it's it's a rural environment. And again, I had a lot of freedom just to just to be outside and do stuff. And, there was, you know, the few lads that, you know, I used to knock around with in the village, we used to sort of have similar interests. And um, so it's always been sort of part of my, yeah, my, yeah. my life. And I think in terms of when I started studying, if you want to phrase it that way, bushcraft more, more deeply, it was about not just the practicalities of how do I light a fire? How do I make a shelter? But also deepening that connection with the natural world. Um, it just felt entirely normal to me to want to be able to know all the, you know, as many uses of, you know, plants and trees and all the other natural resources that are out there. Because, you know, th there's something kind of, for me, there's something kind of quite deep in there. Um, which then when you start looking at, you know, you, you don't need to reflect very long on, you know, where we've come from as a species to realize that, you know, there's a there's a long, long history where we had to rely on that, that skill and that knowledge. And also we had a very, very close relationship with nature. I mean, we're, we're very much part of nature yeah. until, you know, recently. That, so. That's what it was for me. That's why, mm. I, that's one of the deeper reasons because I've started, like I said earlier to you before the podcast, I've started to, I've always immersed myself in a natural world. I've loved going outdoors, hiking, kayaking and stuff like that. But there is something different that when you do start really tapping into them deeper fundamentals of what it actually really means to be human, in my mm. opinion as well, like the, the sense of being able to go in the woods and be able to actually like survive, really. There is like sort of this deeper thing. And But when you said before about um, the kids when you were younger and you said you were, when you were younger, you were immersing yourself already in the natural world. It seems to me though that there's already... Because me and Chris now, we're in our late 20s. But when we were younger... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, don't yeah, mention it though. Late 20s for me. <laughs> <laughs> but when we, were, um, when we were a lot younger, we used to sort of already be playing outside, building camps and things like that. And you were probably the same as well. But at the minute, there seems to be this sort of inst insulated experience where people aren't going outdoors as much mm. and people are staying inside, kids are playing on video games. Mm. Do you think that's an important part that we could be losing about ourselves? Yeah, I think it, I, I, I do. I, I don't know if I worry, but yeah, I do notice that kids are not playing out as much as they used to. I mean, and it wasn't just, you know, we're in the woods all the time. You know, we're, you know, I, I, I was a, I was a, in my yeah early teens just to, yeah from from 10 until like 13 that was the kind of bmx craze yeah. era and you know so we were out on our bikes and we were out you know whenever it wasn't absolutely chucking it down with rain we were you know and it was light we were outside doing something and you know i got a zx spectrum yeah. the 48k <laughs> computer when i was about 11 that my Six dad got games. yeah <laughs> you know, loading the games with the tape or whatever but we only ever used to play on it when it was raining. That was something we did when we couldn't be outside. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, if it was absolutely chucking it down or blowing a gale and chimney pots were flying off roofs or something, you know, it's like, okay, well, let's stay inside and play on the computer then, you know. Whereas it's almost sort of the opposite now that a lot of kids, the default thing is to play on the computer. It's too hot outside, let's stay in. Yeah. <laughs> it's too normal outside, let's stay in. <laughs> um, you know, and I think, but, the, but you know, I think the other thing as well is that parents, and I'm, I'm, this is a very sweeping statement, and it's true, it's not of every, true of everyone, but I do think parents have become more concerned about, you know, kids being abducted and paedophiles and all of that kind of nastiness, which has been, it probably always was there, but it's more in the media now. Very uh, escalated now, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a heightened awareness of that side of society. And I think some parents do want to kind of cause it their, you know, protect their kids away from that, yeah. which is understandable, you know. We used to just be allowed to go out on our bikes all day. You know, we didn't have mobile phones. You know, there was no way of our parents checking if we were okay. You know, we'd go out, you know, I'd come home from school, you know, have a biscuit, get changed, go out on my bike for four hours, come home, have my tea, go to bed. And, and there was no way of knowing yeah. whether I was all right or not. And, and so I think the expectation has changed as well. That the, te- the other side of the technology is that, you know, kids do have phones or they want phones, but parents kind of feel like they almost need to be checking on the kids more as well so i think there's i don't think it's entirely the kids or the technology's fault i think the parents have got something to do with that as well yeah i definitely agree i think there's i think there's something beautiful um about caring for your family showing love and support and nurturing but there's also this there's also this need for growth there's this need Mm. for challenge the need for struggle and that's what something like bushcraft can give you when you're actually out there in the elements there is just like the simplistic, the simplistic view of it, where it's you can create it or you don't, mm. and there's a, you actually thrive or you, or you don't. It's it puts it so much into black and white. There's never, there's never like an in between. And but if you're a child and you're growing up in the, a lavish like luxury lifestyle where everything's catered for you, your needs are given. You're never put in a stressful situation. Never put in a createful situation. Then you're most likely to become unstuck through any simplistic challenge in life. Yeah. Whereas something like going out in nature, going out and exploring at an early age, not only develops you as a person, but and develops your whole life skills and the life, and not just your life skills, but your whole personality can change just from being out in the woods, even for oh, one day. Absolutely, I'd agree with that. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of outdoor activities can develop uh, young people's abilities to develop you know to to enhance skills that are useful in all of their life you know and i think you know you were talking about kayaking and we talk about hiking and you know mountain biking and all of these things you know if you if you go out and you know even if you just go out and get wet and cold a bit and then you're home later on and you're warm and everything's okay you know what you might call type two fun you know type one fun's the stuff you enjoy at the time and type two yeah. stuff you enjoy afterwards when you kind of reflect on it um <laughs> But in meeting those challenges, you learn you learn that you're capable of more. You learn that you, okay, well, that was uncomfortable at the time, or I was a bit cold, or I was a bit wet, or I was a bit tired, or my legs ached, or my feet ached, but I'm okay now. And the next time you encounter that, it's like, okay, well, I, I, I know I can cope with this. Let's you know, see if I can push myself a bit more. And, mm. you know, and I don't think that's necessarily specific to any outdoor activity really i mean you can you can see a lot of that in a lot of different outdoor activities i mean when i was when i was 10 or 11 i wanted i don't know why i I wanted to learn to ride a horse yeah i want and and um so i used to and i started learning to ride when i was um when we lived in wales and we used to there was a place we used to go to and i used to get dropped off there and i used to you know go on these horse riding lessons and things and then as i say when i was 10 we moved to um we moved to the northeast and then the only place really that my parents could find that did horse riding lessons near where we lived was right at the top of Bouldersdale, which is absolutely freezing even in the summer you know it's (laughs) a bit like here yeah (laughs) and I remember doing it I remember going right going up there for lessons and it was kind of getting on for winter and I was just so cold and you know just (laughs) biting wind and you know cold feet and but you know, I still, you know, I can still remember it now as a vivid experience that it was, it was an outdoor experience where I had some hardship, but it wasn't the end of the world. And it was an experience that I kind of got some benefit from that I it was grew character from. Character building, really. Character isn't it? building, yeah, absolutely. And so I think whatever you get young people doing outdoors, there's the scope for having those sorts of experiences. 
And then I think, yeah, I mean, with, with the bushcraft side of things in particular, some things are quite easy to achieve. Um, and it's the same with any sort of skill set, isn't it? Some things are easy, some things are harder. And if you're if you're trying to light a fire in a particular way, um, the as you were saying, the outcome is kind of bivalent. It's like you succeed or you don't succeed. Mm. You get a fire or you don't get a fire. Yeah, Nietzsche's unforgiven as well. It is. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't really care. It's not on your side, but it's not against you either. It just is, as far as I'm concerned. And you know, it's up to you. You know, if you want to make a fire with materials that are there in nature, it's up to you to select them properly, prepare them properly. You can't cut corners. Because the definition of cutting a corner is something that doesn't work, so you can't do something that doesn't work. You have to do it right, mm. um, and the and the evidence that you've done it right is that it, you've got a flame and you've got a sustained fire. And some methods of lighting fires are easier than others, and some materials it's easier to to light a fire with than others. Some um, conditions, you know, warm and dry, it's easier. Cold and wet, it's harder. And <clears throat> there is no point in getting frustrated. If it's not working, you have to adjust what you're doing. Yeah. Mm. Um, and that's quite an important lesson for young people to learn that it isn't about just throwing a temper tantrum or screaming and shouting to get what you want because nature's indifferent. It's like the, the stuff is here to make it work. You have to adjust your attitude and adjust what you're doing to make it work. And that's also, to be honest with you, it's not just a lesson that a lot of kids would benefit from learning. It's a lot of adults would benefit <laughs> yeah, from learning exactly. learning that lesson as well. Um, you know, you, and it's embedded in the way that people think. You have people saying things like, "This, this isn't working." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, this fire. I, you know, these things. I, I can't get my fire lit. It's not working. Well, no, they're not doing anything unless you do something with them. It's down to you to make it work. And it's that sort of externalization of, of the problem. It's actually, no, the problem's you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, not a, that's not a fixed thing. Because again, people think of it like, I can do this or I can't do this. And I think that's one of the other things I always try and teach people is that mm. your abilities are not fixed. You know, there, there's this nasty thing that I don't know where it comes from that a lot of people have where they, they say, I'm not good at maths. Mm. I'm not good at I'm not good at knots. That's a common one. I'm I'm no good at knots. You know, a, a lot of people say. I know we were talking about knots before, but it, yeah. it's a, it's it's a general thing that a lot of people say. I'm no good at knots. I'm no good at like when you start teaching people navigation and you mention degrees or angles or people, you know, they 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 yeah. they close off. You know, it's like there's a mental and it's due to some experience in the past, probably with a bad maths teacher or. Yeah struggling to tie their shoelaces and you know the, the, those little negative experiences that people have and they sort of grow to be bigger than they are but also nobody ever tells young people that those things aren't fixed mm -hmm. okay not everyone's going to be a mathematical genius not everyone's going to be a complete and utter knot nerd that knows you know a thousand knots but you can get better at these things with practice uh, you just have to apply yourself to them and, um, you know, one of the great things I think about taking people outdoors and teaching them about what's possible is that hopefully over time they realize and they can reflect on where they started and where they've ended up at that point in time, that they can see that their abilities are developing and that there's a broader lesson there, which is, oh, I can learn and I can grow. And, and that's true of adults as, as it is for kids. Yeah. You know? So that's one of the things, that, one of the deeper things that I get out of teaching people it's not just about can you light a fire, can you build a shelter, what what can we eat? It's about developing yourself as a as yeah. a human being. So going back yeah. to what you were saying before, I, I love that because I think yeah. it is there is a much more deeper. I mean, every, no matter what you do in life, you're always going to see the top layer of whatever it is. But all them different subjects, whatever you pursue, there's like there is a, a much more deeper sort of mm. fundamental thing that does spark something within your own psyche, whatever it is. Do you when you were talking before about um, sort of the the skills and things like that of 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 people understanding these skills and partaking in them and, and sort of enhancing an ability that we may have already always had but we've lost do you think that these all these different skills of sort of bushcraft and sort of understand how to build a fire or whatever it is survival mm. to a sense do you think that is to a certain degree we need to actually it's a put it's, it's an important part of our evolution as a human like we need to actually there'll be a time where we may not have to get back to that or something like that do you ever feel well, that? Well, there's, there's a number of, there's a number of different things in there um 
So I'll, I'll I'll try and disentangle them. So a little I just bit. waffled there. No, 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 <laughs> it's, it's, it's no, no, it's fine because there's a couple. Yeah, you of... Untangle the knot. <laughs> <laughs> Make a fire with that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mr. Bushcraft, what can you do that? <laughs> what can you build with that? <laughs> so there's there's a few things. I think I think in terms of these things being important in our past, I think I I wouldn't mm. I wouldn't necessarily say that the skills are innate. I mean, you've yeah. got to learn. You've yeah. got to learn them. But I think there are certain things which, if you're honest with your true nature, that they'll resonate with you. Like it's hard for anyone, like particularly on a bit of a chilly evening, it's hard for anyone not to appreciate sitting around a campfire. Even on a summer's evening, you know, sitting around a campfire with other people, it creates a certain atmosphere which Mm -hmm. somehow is quite primal. And And I don't mean that in a kind of base sort of way, like, you know, like thuggish violence some people say well that's quite primal but i mean there's Mm. something quite that resonates with our nature about that coming together around a fire it's clearly and it and it doesn't matter where you are you know you can go to you know you can go down to the woods in in britain or you can go to scandinavia or go to north america or go to australia or wherever and people have a similar attitude towards you know something about coming together and and soon as there's a fire in camp and people are sitting around and there's a there's a certain it doesn't matter whether the, the, there's a bricklayer or a chief executive or a doctor or you know somebody who's you know a dry stone waller or a nurse or or, or whatever everyone's kind of people around the fire and that's one of the things i notice on on my courses as well that you know you get people from all sorts of different walks of life coming to to want to do a bushcraft course for example but you get everyone around a campfire and there's a commonality there with a lot of people which is which is fantastic and that to me sort of speaks that particular instance it seems to me that there's something kind of resonates quite deeply with us about that that environment because people tend to react to it in a similar in a similar fashion regardless of their background Mm. um so I think you've got to learn the skills of how to light a fire like you've always had to, you know, and there, and there will have been some, you know, Stone Age genius that's come up with certain jumps forward, I would imagine, you know, that people ponder this question of how on earth did we get from being, you know, what what people often characterize as you know a, you know a sort of chimp like creature up a tree in africa mm. near the rift valley somewhere to people who could you know light and control fires at will at what point did that happen and clearly there's a lot of there's a lot of you know speculation and there's a lot of work being done and you know to, you know it's all allied with growing of brains and size of you know and then pressures from the environment and all these sorts of things but the the fact of the matter is that at some point somebody figured out how to do it mm-hmm. and then that skill was probably passed on um and it's it's quite likely i i would say that as 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 the, if there were different isolated populations that possibly other you know the number of people in different populations figured it out at some point in time doesn't necessarily need to spread from some point source in the same way that you see you know similar technologies at different points in time developing in different places so it's it's entirely conceivable that over time different populations of humans or human ancestors develop fire but that all all that sort of speculation aside yeah. um once the skill was acquired by somebody you know the way that we best um acquire knowledge that's already been figured out is by learning it from somebody else and it being passed on and um so i don't necessarily think the skills are innate that's what i'm coming back to i think that you know it's something that you you know when whether it was back way back when or recently you still need to learn you need to learn those skills so that that's kind of the thing i I picked out about that and then the the question that you asked that was based on all of that what would remind me of the question where you were going with that? I can't remember now. You said the piece I've, of string. <laughs> I can't remember. I've got another good question. Or I, I was keeping, keeping on the terms yeah. of ev- when you're talking about evolution there, I've got a good question. Because um, so if you've been sort of, you, you're somebody who's immersed in the bushcraft side of things and you're really on the ground level of understanding them, deeper fundamental skills, looking from sort of that level where you're more sort of, you're put, placing yourself on a regular basis, looking in this is a big question but looking in terms of evolution from that perspective what do you think could have been the some of the main things 
on that sort of primitive level that could have sparked evolution? And I, that's a big question. Could have sparked evolution? Yeah. Looking, looking from a bushcraft perspective, because I think everyone, everyone looking at this question is like me and me, Chris, me, me, me and Chris, a lot of the listeners are not really people who are, are really connecting on a, on a regular basis to them, them core fundamental skills mm. of what it really is to be human. Mm. Well, I would say that you are doing that. You're building fires quite a lot. You're mm. teaching these skills to people. So you're really seeing the, the more in- integrate details of that. Mm. So I just thought maybe from a bushcraft perspective, okay. well, I'll, could, I'll, I'll, I'll how do you view try that? And and that's, a big, that's a big question. Perspective on that. Put your thought and stay in bushcraft. <laughs> <laughs> I remembered what the previous question was, whether or not we might have to go back to relying on that as well. That was where we were that's going. That's a big yeah. question. That, that was... Um, we'll go back to that. Yeah. So, um, so in terms of... It, it's interesting because there's always... An, there's, you know, if my understanding of evolutionary theory is correct then it's always it, it's it's never about the species in isolation it's about the interaction between the species and the environment that that species is in and it's um you know and if you if you put if you put a species in a vacuum they're not going it's not going to evolve it evolves as a result of uh, pressures and you know parameters and constraints that are imposed by the environment and so to the extent that we started to manipulate our environment more then that clearly is has the potential to have an effect on our biological evolution um it certainly had an effect on our um evolution of of skills you know we you know we've we've learned to manipulate things um you know and i I was saying to somebody the other day that um we haven't really moved beyond uh, 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 being clever monkeys that can use fire. You know, I drove here in a car. Yeah. What drives my car? Well, it's a controlled fire under the bonnet. That's yeah. what it is. I'm burning a fuel mm. in my little metal yeah. box. And, you know, we're still very reliant on that technology. And we're moving to a point where okay, we've got electric cars and we're harnessing wind and solar and stuff. And so we're kind of, in a way, we're kind of bypassing fire for the first time there. We're sort of starting to tell ourselves we need to stop burning so much stuff for various reasons. But actually, we're still kind of at the end of that big, long, okay, we've we've learned how to make a fire. What can we do with it? And some of the technologies that we're only just really starting to maybe stop using, mm it's still very much reliant on that, you know, burning coal, burning gas for power stations, you know, you know, even in, even in my lifetime, the number of people that used to have, you know, log fires or yeah, coal, coal fires yeah. in their houses compared to now, is it's reduced massively, you know, modern houses, they're more well insulated, we're using central heating and that energy is coming from somewhere else. We're still burning gas, a lot of us, and we're still using electricity, which is a lot of it's coming from burning, you know, still but from burning fossil fuels. But we're only just moving beyond this being kind of quite, quite creative, clever monkeys that can burn stuff. Yeah. Mm. And, um, yeah. and so, you know, to the extent that we started with a campfire, you know, by bashing rocks together, maybe, um, and it probably was um, some, you know, somebody knocking rocks together, maybe trying to make something else that realized that you got some sparks off it, how they then made the leap to, yeah. I can light something with that, I, you know, we can speculate, but we're never going to know for sure. Mm. Um not unless somebody invents a time machine. We're never gonna. We're never gonna know for sure how well, you that. You never know. No. <laughs> Where I'm going, like. Yeah. You never know. Um, you know, and some people. You know, it's harder to find. Ever. You know, clearly, lithic stuff, stones, stone tools last a long time in the archaeological record. So people got a very good idea of how long hominids, you know, have been yeah. fashioning things out of rock, and you can sort of start to you know, look at fire hearths that are being found and try and carbon date them and, and date them with other things that are found in conjunction with them and get some idea of, okay, how long have we been using fire? And it seems to seems to broadly match with when, we, you know, it was sometime after we started bashing rocks together to make things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's conceivable that that's how we, we got to that point. I mean, 
we would have been i would imagine if the if our understanding of the history of the world is um at all you know accurate that we would have had some experience of fires because fires happen naturally i mean we've seen that yeah. a lot recently you know with the forest fire with the dry summer we've had mm -hmm. recently you know the forest fires in north america and scandinavia and even upland fires in the uk there's been you know they happen naturally and it isn't just people being careless you know a lot of forest fires around the world happen because of lightning and that's a natural phenomenon i'm sh i'm absolutely sure that you know our ancestors living in whatever environment they lived in would have had experience of fire because it yeah, it, occur, it, it would occur naturally yeah. and so at some point um maybe they made the connection between what they could generate and what they'd already experienced in nature um and so you know but then once we start being able to control aspects of our environment more um once we start making tools we've got better access to food maybe um you've then maybe got you know weapons as well so your ability to um dominate within a certain area as a, as a particular group you know that starts to change the dynamic so you know i would imagine that there's there's a very close um relationship between the ability to get some advantage in the environment and it having some effect on your on your evolution going forwards what that what that effect been it means a very complex it's a very complex set of factors isn't it i mean you know it's, it's very it's very i mean it, is, it would be very hard to very hard to model even um the the evolution of any one particular species in in the in the absence of them making tools and being able to start to, yeah. to manipulate yeah, their environment point, never yeah. mind once you start throwing that extra factor in you know what 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 difference did that make you know what difference you know you could also argue that in some ways it made us softer yeah definitely you know, I was just thinking that the same yeah, thing I was yeah. just thinking uh, what would be the difference between someone say like you raising a family raising them like be in nature be in the wild still to keep more natural roots than see a computer analyst working 60 hours a day teaching his kids to be a computer analyst mm. their kids and they're living in it's kind of like you are both going on a different evolutionary tract here's something though because i was this was it's funny it's really funny you said that because i was just a question i was just going to ask you there on the, on the sense of that because i'm not sure and i want to ask you this question i'm not sure if the if because Technology is advancing really fast now, and we are becoming something different, right? But I'm actually not too sure if we are becoming something different. If we're not already still that thing, it's actually the the thing that we're immersed in, like the machine that's actually cha that's changed. But we're not that much similar. So mm. maybe the compute analyst, on more of a, like an innate level, is not different. Is not that much different from the the the, the yeah. primitive guy. Have you ever thought about that? Well, that's what I was sorry <laughs> again. <laughs> but I was, I was just going to say as well. Would say if you brought that computer analyst's grandkids who's been involved in stuff like that for the last generation and generation and that's all he knows and if you put him into like your scenario and of teaching him survival of teaching him bushcraft of teaching him the outdoor world would he get it just as much as anyone else or would he completely have to like break down his evolution of who he is well i think there's 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 there's, there's two there's a quite a couple of different uses of the word evolution i mean my, my understanding of darwin's theory it isn't just you know it's not an individual who evolves like you're, you're not i mean not in the true sense of evolution you're not going to evolve yet you are the set of genes that your parents gave to you and you are you are going to interact with the environment and you're going to procreate and you're going to you know whatever that that's that's the path of you mm. passing your genes on and the the my understanding is the way that the evolution works is that you have an interaction with the environment and your particular genetic makeup gives you some advantages mm. in some situations and some disadvantages in some situations um and so for example i mean one of the easiest ones to 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 say to show is that like there's a lot of sickle cell anemia in africa right um, what, what's that sorry, sickle cell anemia so it's when you're when your red blood cells are sickle shaped and it and it causes and they're, they're malformed red blood cells and it right. form it, it creates a form of anemia because i think you can't your, your hemoglobin you can't carry as much hemoglobin um 
you 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 can't carry as much um, iron in the blood cells. I think that's but 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 basically you get these sickle cell right. sickle shaped red blood cells. But one of the the offshoots of sickle cell anemia of having sickle cells is that you are more resistant to malaria infections. So even though sickle cell anemia is a problem in itself, it actually gives you a an advantage in a world where malaria might otherwise kill you. Yeah. So some of these some of these genetic influences can be a disadvantage in some situations and an advantage in some other situations and and it's you know I almost see it like it's a very complex kind of you know there's things that you give to kids where you put in like square things through a square hole and star shaped things through a star shaped yeah. hole and a round thing through a round shaped hole um you know if if the test was you know, if if all if all that's being thrown at you is a bunch of square shaped things, and you've got lots of square shaped holes, you're going to get more of them through, and you win the game of getting things through. Whereas somewhere else, if your filter, if you think of that 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 as your genetic makeup, somewhere else, it's it's a different shaped thing, and the game is to get as many through. Somebody else with more of that shape is going to win the game. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of almost like a filter versus the environment of what advantages and what disadvantages you have. So, you know, if you if you uh, you know if 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 in a certain situation being big and strong is advantageous then big and strong people might do better in that under that stress but equally being big and strong might be a disadvantage in another environment it might be better to be small and compact you know yeah. because you know you need less energy or to to maintain the body or you know you mm. need less food or whatever it is so there are there are there are there are attributes which can be advantages and disadvantages and in different in different circumstances and they're very very simplistic examples i'm using i mean our genetic makeup's complex yeah, and of course, there's multiple things going th on there's lots and lots of different things and and it, and it isn't a one factor problem it's like you you know and it isn't also one person evolving it's the population and it's the population that is being that is being subjected to that particular pressure mm -hmm. you know so if you you know so for example you're a you're a you're a small population that's isolated and you're living in an environment where it's cold and there isn't a lot of food but your genetic makeup is such that you're quite good at co you know coping with cold conditions and you can go a long time without food um and then you're you know you can then eat food and your enzymes are still functioning that's an advantage versus you know a different a different reaction to those certain circumstances work but then if you're in a different environment under different pressures you might not do as well as another population yeah. so mm -hmm. it's always you know so you've got this almost like randomized you know genetic mutation that goes on so it's like basically there's lots of different variations that are thrown out there based mm -hmm. based around the same model and then when they come into contact with pressures from the environment some of them do better some of them don't do so well so it's a little bit like those shapes getting through the getting through you know getting yeah. through um that sort of filter it's like some of so certain populations are going to do well certain certain or certain people within that population are going to do well certain people within that population are not going to do well and so the natural selection mm -hmm. which is the the outcome of this is that that interaction between people or the species and the environment select certain people positively and other people negatively and that repeats and repeats and repeats and repeats and repeats and repeats and repeats in lots of different nuanced ways so to then try and throw in well how does um how does our ability to manipulate the environment in increasingly sophisticated ways starting with things like making fires and making stone tools and everything that's come since then um how does that throw things how does that change the mix um what it's done to our genetic makeup exactly i i, I i'm not a geneticist i, I and I'm, I'm sure even a geneticist would would be reticent to speculate on that but what i can see what it seems to have done in terms of the outcome is there's a lot more of us you know if you look at the, you know as, as it's become easier as we've become better at manipulating our environment it's been easier for more for, for there to be for there to be more of us um it's it's you know so 
it's it's harder to die now yeah. Yeah. as a human than it has been at pretty much any point in history. I would say that's one thing because it's safer. You know, we mm. kind of so going back to what we were saying before is that you know we're 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 worried about all these little minor risks. But actually, the chances of your child being abducted by a paedophile are, are pretty are pretty low, particularly in first world, you know, nations. Yeah. The chances of you, you know, I was looking at, I don't know why I was looking at this the other day, but like road traffic deaths in Britain, are, 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 they're about seven, I mean, it's still way too high, but 1,700 people a year. In the past, it was, you know, at times it was nearly 10,000 because a lot of what we do to manipulate our environment is to mitigate the risks and it's to you know things are safer you know air air traffic is safe a lot of you know given the number of you know driving over here tonight the number of the number of cars on the road at yeah. this time of day it, it's colossal Crazy. but we pretty much managed to do it without killing ourselves and each other which is quite surprising and it's uh, like it? <laughs> it's, it's, it's incredible when you think yeah. like this the number of cars on the people. a1m and nobody's really kind dying you know 70 it's, miles an hour yeah just yeah yeah um so my point is that we 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 tend to like to try and manipulate the environment in a way that allows more of us to survive for longer, which makes complete sense. I mean, um, and despite all of the wars and famines and things we've had, even in the 20th century, there's a lot more of us now than there were, you know, 50 years ago. There's a lot more than 100 yeah. years ago, you know, but sanitation's better. Um, drinking water is more uh, readily available. Um, antibiotics, all of these things have mitigated against environmental pressure. You know, it's it's you know it's easier to get clean drinking water. It's hard, it, even if you are infected with something that might have been, um, you know, some pathogenic organism which might have done you in in the past. We can often get around it now, and so all of these pressures that we used to succumb to were now, on the whole. You know, still there's plenty of people dying yeah. of all sorts of things every day. Don't get me wrong, but we are more resilient. We we have put things in place now. Whether that actually makes us as a species more resilient is a, just, diff is a different question. That's a good question. I was yeah. just about to say that because when you were on the subject of even the sense of driving, so the sense of driving could be seen as is more. It's more secure, even though it's probably not. But the sense of driving, you could be more safe because you you're not exposed to the natural. Um, environment you're not exposed to rain you're not supposed to exposed to wet you're not physically using this meat suit to have to walk and your joints aren't getting aching but there's something within in that that actually could could be making us weaker and in the sense of like you said before about the drinking the water as well like in the past we could have drank water we could have built up more our immune system could have got a lot stronger i think that goes for so much so much stuff. yeah but I, I don't think that's necessarily evolution that's just your physical I mean, you guys have got a background in health and fitness, so it's, yeah. it's about your physical conditioning, mm -hmm. yeah? yeah? And so an individual physical condition is about putting stress on the physical systems yeah. and developing stronger, more resilient physical systems within you as a person. Yeah. And also the mental side of things as well. You yeah. know, we kind of often sort of dislocate the brain from the body, but it's one system. Mm -hmm. And there is a there's a learning that goes on you know, it's like if you do a lot of hard cardiovascular endurance sport uh, and you progress in that, your your ability to endure that type of exercise mentally increases over time. It's, it's not just a physical it's, thing. It's interesting though, as well because there is within that as well though, there is, there is like certain tests you can get done now and you can t test what sort of like what is your body type mm. your internal body type what's it more leaning towards mm -hmm. and it's funny because like some people can actually be can be genetically more inclined to sort of weightlifting or running or mm -hmm. something like that but then when it comes to their day-to-day -day life they're not even they're not even doing that so they're training the other pathways again yes so the body is coming from an evolutionary perspective is coming from that but it's also been naturally by whatever they're doing being pulled in another direction mm. so like you said before there's multiple forces yeah. going on yeah and and so they they might be you know they might have have a, a genetic predisposition to respond well to strength training but if they're living in a situation where strength doesn't matter that's yeah. not an advantage yeah whereas if they were say living as in, in some sort of gladiatorial yeah. existence <laughs> where being big and strong was an advantage mm. you know whether that might be in combat whether it might be as just part of their life you know that of yeah. physical activity that they were doing to to exist then it's an advantage over and above somebody who 
wouldn't be as big and strong given the same stimulus. And, you know, people, I mean, I, I want to try and avoid this not sounding racist. It's not supposed to sound racist at all. And if it comes out that way, I apologize. It, is, it really isn't. Um, people often ask, why are, why are black people really good sprinters? Why are they really good boxers? Yeah. What? Oops, sorry. There was there was there was an evolutionary pressure put on them, and yeah. it's and it's a shameful one, but it was slavery. Like the bigger, stronger, more fit to survive guys survived, mm. and and that's and that's not me making that up. That's a that's a fairly as far as I know, it's a fairly well yeah, established yeah. theory. So where there is where there is pressure on a population, where certain physical attributes give them an advantage that situation selects the people that have got that advantage. The the unsavory flip side of this whole evolutionary thing is that it generally involves lots of people dying that don't make it. Mm -hmm. That's that's the flip side. So, you know, we, we keep worrying about are we not evolving, we're not stressing ourselves. But for that for it to work, you need it needs to be existence needs to be so marginal. For there to be, do you know what I mean? It's like, you know, it's like, it's like if there, if there were us three and uh, and thirty other people, and we were put in a really difficult situation to the extent that some of our different physical attributes meant that some of us survived and some of us didn't. That's natural selection in action. Like nature, that's, that's, nature operates yeah, like that as yeah. well. Nature but that's does. not a situation that most people want to live in for the good of the future of humanity. Unfortunately, yeah, yeah. one of the best examples of that. Or fortunately, yeah. yeah. The, one of the best examples of that, which shows individual genetic makeup versus geographical genetic makeup versus a collective individual um, genetic makeup, is the story of Marcus Togby, who was a um, who was a, you would um, like this book. Mm, yeah, really it was. Good. It's called the Runner. It's a um, really good book, and he. Was so basically to explain what the runner is for anyone who doesn't know so basically the runner me and chris has both read it just to give you context mm. but he's basically a guy who sort of lives in the monday world and he's had enough of society and he runs away and lives in the woods right and he learns a lot of skills yeah. basically and he spends and he spends four years in the woods just running every single day he's from the um sweden range mm. so he's infused his body to be more cold resilient and he gets in a run because he still competes um, in the competitions and he goes on a run and he meets a lot of Kenyan athletes mm. who were running and they beat his time and he was um, one of the Swedish amateur champions and they beat him by an hour mm. on this run he couldn't believe it so he went to the coach and went how do I run like that I'll do whatever it takes and he went come to this this flight get this village and your train will begin mm -hmm. so he does that and he gets there and he follows their train regime to an absolute T, their diet to an absolute T. Each, every single aspect of his life revolved around their their exact form of current training, what they were... So he matched their training and matched everything, and diet, but he everything. never had the genetic capability mm. or the ge geographical capability from the genetics, from their evolution. So what happened was he lost so much weight, he actually became so thin... Even though he was like thin at their level, mm. he couldn't catch up with them. He was completely out of his element just through the different bone structures, the different um, density. He had to come to the realization that he couldn't, whatever he'd done, no matter how far he progressed there, because he was there for about, was it six to 12 months? I can't remember, it was a long time. I think it was a year he spent mm. there no matter what he done he could never do it because mm. there's too much genetic differences even though he can put himself in there but it, like you said before the evolutionary yeah of and, and and it goes it goes to i think it goes to reinforce that these these genetic differences are marginal and they're only when you're right at the out so if you think of like most people's ability as a kind of normal distribution or whatever distribution it happens to be mm. it's it's the far end of the distribution so if you had, like if you said can you get most people to run 5k in a certain reasonable 5k run time you probably could you know you probably get 80 90 95 percent of the population with an with you know six months training to be able to do that you know unless they were you know, disabled or they had, you know, severe cardiovascular disease already or whatever. Yeah. Most 
you know, re- you know, reasonably healthy people. Well, not even reasonably healthy, but most people, you could probably get to do that. But then, as you increase the distance or increase the speed for that distance, the number of people that you're ever going to be able to get to do that decreases, mm-hmm. doesn't it? You kind of you're further and further out into the distribution. You know, you're you're right at the margins, and it's you know, it's the same with like how many people are ever going. You know, even if they try trained would are ever going to be able to lift at a competitive olympic weightlifting level not many you know how many are ever going to be able to you know sprint 100 meters at an international level very very mm-hmm. few and it does you know so as 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 the as the filter becomes more extreme the number of people that are going to pass that filter decreased yeah because mm. yeah. to, to do that as well obviously to do that as well you've got to give a we a part of your other self so like you say if in the past where hunter gatherers or people who were bushcraft and they would have to be more flexible and have to be balanced in many different areas and like you said there's as civilization society becomes more sort of flexible and you don't have to go and hunt your own food you can just be more marginalized in one certain area of your life you can put all your focus in there and that's why yeah. things on the world are in every area really that's why the world in general is starting to become more technically developed because our basic needs are met and then when your basic needs are met civilization goes Zhoop. yeah well it's that i mean there's a number of things there aren't there? i mean there's maslow's hierarchy of needs yeah. you know it's like you know to start off with you need food you need water you need sustenance you need it may be a sexual partner or whatever. There's some basic things yeah. there that are, you know, sort of, you don't really worry about much else until you get those things sorted out. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. then you build, you know, and that's that classic Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And on an individual basis, that's kind of how you approach, you approach life. I mean, you're not really going to worry about, you know, reconciling quantum physics with relativistic physics if you can't put a meal on the table really you know your your focus is a much more short short term it's like you need to focus on where where can i get food where can i get water but once you've got those basic things then individually you can start worrying about slightly more you know higher higher level concerns as it were and and then as as the more people as a society you have that are in that situation then the more of that stuff that's going on and then the other thing as well of course is that you then get specialization you know i've had this conversation with a number of people recently about you know stone age tools for example and and asking them you know we live in a world where specialization is completely normal mm. you know the we have a doctor we have you know somebody who fixes roofs we have somebody who drives a bus you know that they're, they're, they're quite specialized jobs even the guy who drives the bus is not the guy who fixes the bus yeah you know they're, they're all very specialized quite narrow narrow fields mm-hmm. and in the past partly because life wasn't as complicated as it is now but in the past people would have been more generalists yeah and and they would have been able to do you know a number of different things but the question still arises you know would there have been a specialist you know, like the village flint napper or the tribe, you know, where the pe- where there would be the, these people who were specialised or would everyone be able to have some level of skill? And I think the general the general consensus among, you know, paleoanthropologists and archaeologists is that the, some people were certainly better than others, but a lot, there was a lot, of, you know, the variation that you see is probably a vari- variation because... There were lots of people doing things. Mm. You know, it's like if you ask if you ask people to to, to draw who've never really had any drawing um, training. Some people are naturally better at it than others, and even with training, some people yeah. are always na- you know remain better than others. You know, some people are just more skillful, naturally skillful in certain areas. Mm. But even so, you know, people. It seems to be the consensus that people would have had a, a generalist skill set and. Um, that's more possible when life's less complicated. Like I remember my dad, he used to do most of the most of the work on his car, yeah. you know, himself. And this is, wasn't that long ago. It was like 30 years ago. He'd be draining the oil, changing the oil filter, you know, doing all these things that you can't do now on a modern car because of, you know, it's all sealed in. There's all the electronic timing stuff. There's, you know, you, you can't fix a lot of things yourself with a modern car so it has to go to the garage they have to plug it into a computer you yeah. need a specialist technician and so as as things become more complex as the systems that we have are more complex we are not able to just as a generalist fix them 
but it also takes more complex a, a sort of accumulations of people to to make those things in the first place like you know we all use smartphones you know we're sat here and we're using nice microphones and you've got a mixer there and yeah. you've got a nice digital camera there but no, I, I would put money on none of the three of us can make any of those things yeah no no, yeah. no. And it's partly an access to resources, you know, like I don't have access to the aluminium and all the bits yeah. and pieces, and all the, just, all the raw materials, add, but add equally, a, yeah. we don't have the individual know-how to make this. Yeah, and that's it. but I still, I still think that there's a, I mean, it is good having these microphones, it's amazing that we can have this conversation and, and all these different specialised areas do produce these things, but I still think that, I mean, I don't know if this, this is, this is the, the complete answer, but it's what I'm feeling. I still think that by becoming a specialized in certain areas that we do lose a part of who we truly are. I don't know what, it, I can't put my finger on what it th- is, but it's there's may- something there. Do you think that may be because of the fact that um, in the beginning of time, just like what Paul was saying there, that the majority of people was a generalist and they did do a lot of general activities, but nature itself, it isn't something which is complex. Like we're saying, it's like, it's the do or die. It's like you adapt or survive. And the whole concept of it is, the whole the whole beautiful concept of it is that nature hasn't changed. Nature is exactly the same as it was 100, 200 years ago. It's just us in what we class as our surroundings, what we're altering and changing. But nature itself is still the exact same. So you put a human being in that situation again, you throw me in the wild. I'm wondering, do I resort back to natural instincts of who I am as an individual? And can I conjure up... Um, the survival instincts in me probably engaging like hunting um um foraging mm-hmm. and really um thrive in that scenario i'm wondering could i because i i've already my ancestors have already been there that's what i want to know well it gets back to the question that i did i did ask before about is it like I said, I, I proposed this, the concept that I don't, I'm not sure if that the person working in a computer desk now is any different to somebody who yeah. was like I know you said there's a lot of go- there's a lot in terms of evolutionary going on. Like you said before, they could be more adapted to to certain cold environments. They could um, whatever it is, it could be you said they could be stronger, like biologically, mm-hmm. whatever it is. But I still still think that there is something that is still. I mean, maybe this is maybe a good place to take it as well. Maybe in the future that's not going to be there anymore because there's a thing in my head is where, say if someone is driving a car, like you were talking, they used the example of someone driving a car before. We don't know really what that's doing to us. Like that's a very, like we don't, on a biological level, in a sort of mind level, we don't know what that situation compared to being in the woods is actually doing to us Hmm. on a biological level or evolutionary level, whatever it is. But I just... I still think that there's just something, there's just a part of us that tells us it just doesn't feel right. No, I think, and, and again, I think there's, there's there's quite a few things that are kind of to carry on with a string analogy. There's a few things that are kind of tangled in <laughs> some together knots, uh... together here. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, is so, how, this is how we roll. <laughs> yeah, no, that's cool. That's cool. Um, <laughs> Throw things together and give yeah, it. Yeah, no, and it's interesting <laughs> to see what comes out at the other end. Um, so, I, I mean. If you if you if you if you're saying you know somebody you know is mm. is there much difference between somebody who works as a you know computer scientist all day and somebody who works as an outdoor educator all day? I would say not really. Just in the same way as um, there's very little you know going back to the going back to the example, you could get most people to run 10k in six months yeah. time. You know wh- what wherever they started. Yeah, there's not you know whether they started as you know, a, a PTI and could already do it or somebody who sits at a desk all day and hasn't, you know, run anything anywhere since they were at school. You could probably get most people to do that. You know, the fundamental mechanics of a person and their brain, you know, the fundamental mm-hmm. model yeah. is is pretty similar. Um, I think, you know, so, so linking it back to the evolution argument is that it's the differences that make the mm. difference under ex- and it needs to be under enough pressure that would cause some people to not make it and some people to make it or at least some people to be able to procreate and other people not to be able to procreate because those genes need to be passed on to the next generation 
you know if, if they're successful they're passed on and if they're not successful but that isn't but it's still not an individualistic thing it's like what happens across a, a population that what 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 survives from one generation to the next mm. and then the next generation the next generation which 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 gene which genes are selected and which ones aren't on an individual basis um i think that you're right the question you know what can the you know so we're not going to you know genetically we're not going to evolve and as an individual it's the population that evolves genetically over time yeah. but as an individual i think it's a more interesting question to ask you like what what does it do to our brain you know if we're looking at a screen all day if we've got lots of social media distractions every six seconds what's that doing to our brain versus as just having a very fluid coherent um existence in the woods for example or in you know in a natural environment Maybe just a conversation in general because there's an example of like say we used to do podcasts on skype there's mm. something there's something more different that happens mm. of having it doing it in person. absolutely yeah there's all those non-verbal cues there's you know we're looking at each other in the eye yeah, yeah. there's body language there's you know there's things going on that we don't even yeah. things yeah. going on we don't even understand exactly exactly um so yeah, it is an interesting question to ask: What is it doing as to us as an individual, and what is it doing to us as a society? Um, you know, we're increasingly distracted. Um, people are less patient. Um, people need to fill their time with stuff all the time. Um, people are agitated. Uh, people get annoyed with each other you know over stupid stuff there's there's a kind of general antsiness about the way we live these days which i'm sure there are disagreements and things that go on in you know in in hunter gatherer societies and whatnot but in my limited experience they seem to be quite chilled a lot of the time they seem to have more time yeah. um and it and, and that's not to say that violence doesn't happen in is even it just the environment just well, I, I, I mean, I, I do think, I mean, there's, there's an increasing amount of evidence, isn't there, that people who have regular contact with nature, it, do, it, it, it does actually change your brain. You know, mm -hmm. that if you do, if you do MRI scans and things of, uh, of people's brains that, you know, it's the same as meditation. You yeah. can show it actually has a physical effect on the brain. Mm -hmm. You know, even just spending a small amount of time in a green environment has been shown to have a change, have, yeah. have, has, a, has a, a visible effect on people's mood. Mm -hmm. Showing people pictures of trees has a visible effect on their mood. Did you see the, there was an experiment where they had two, patient, two groups of patients. One group of patients were left in a white room, another group of patients with the same conditions. I know there's obviously a lot of things influencing that, but very much the similar conditions. And the group who was in immersed in nature actually healed themselves better mm -hmm. than... Mm -hmm people who were in yeah, blank there's an room. increasing amount of studies like that but the one i found fascinating was this concept that you could even just show pictures of natural environments yeah, to really people nice. and it improved their moods you didn't even have to put that's them in the insane, environment yeah so there's something very again deeply wired there in terms of our connection with natural environments and so there's two concerns there i mean one is that people you know people are not spending enough time in nature and what is the effect that's having on society that that's one concern and the, themselves as well of course um but the bigger the bigger concern is that we need to make sure there's natural environments there for people to yeah. actually interact with you know that we mm. that we did just keep destroying them and i think one of the dangers of people not interacting with nature is that they don't value it and you know then there's nobody to defend it you know there's 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 this sort of snowballing effect that we have where you know, we need to, you know, and this, I'm not criticizing you guys for having nice microphones, but all this stuff came from somewhere. Yeah, we're, we're aware of that. Dug, Don't worry dug about out that. of the, yeah, yeah, you know, and, and I think those of us that care about nature are increasingly aware of this, that the stuff that we use comes from somewhere. It's dug out the ground somewhere. It's made in a factory somewhere. Um, and that has knock on effects. And the more of us there are that are consuming those things or owning those things or using those things, the more of an effect. Mm. it has and you know it's it's a concern for me is it's, that... we it's weird because there's so many contradictions within our being of mm. what, we, what we're doing and things like that um what was the thing i was going to see it before again oh, i lost trailer for it will it come what was i going to see again i had a good question i want to ask you 
while you're remembering, I'll, I'll throw come, something I'll else back, in there. I'll come it'll back, it'll I'll pop come back out. Yeah, come if back. you don't focus on it, it'll come out. Um, it would be extremely so. Say, for example, we were like, no, I don't. You know, I, I don't want to. I don't want to be involved in this this whole rigmarole anymore. This hmm. industrial society that we live in. I don't want to use all of these things. I don't want to be responsible for you know mines in South America and deforestation around the world mm-hmm. and you know. All of these things, and I'm going to go off, and I'm going to live in the woods. It's very difficult to do that here now. Yeah, you know, in the like, UK, you'd, you'd you'd struggle to do that. I mean, it, there's less than ten percent of the UK is covered by forest. Most of it is monoculture fields of grass and oilseed rape, and whoa. you know, if you if you go around the, you know, even here, it's not, you know, it, it, you don't have to go that far to find hedgerows and fields and things. And, you know, the northeast is less populated than some parts of the UK. But to actually go and find an actual natural environment is quite difficult. Mm. You know, it's something, you know, something that isn't just entirely managed by people. And a lot of it's farmland. You know, if you look at a, just yesterday, I don't know even why, it just happened to go past in one of, one of the, the, the feeds I was looking at. It was a, a sort of aerial view of, of Pembrokeshire. And it is just a patchwork of, of fields, you know, with a few little lines of yeah. trees mm. and, head, you know, be hawthorn and blackthorn and all the other hedgerow species. But most of the, the area is, is, is grass or crops or, or what have you. And, you know, so you were saying, you know, well, nature's the same as it was. We've changed. Well, actually, no, oh, the thing is now we've point. changed the environment yeah. and, and increasingly so. And, you know, if you look at, you know, there are big swathes of, of natural environments still out there, but less and less and less. And it's, you know, and this is, mm. this is one of the concerns. It's more man made as well. Well, I mean, but, but if you get outside of the UK, for example, you go into Northern Scandinavia, there's yes. still quite big swathes of boreal forest, but even the boreal forest, you know, industrialization through Russia and through North America, you know, oil, oil sands, you know, tar sands, oil extraction in, mm. in, Canada, for example, yeah. where they're cutting whole swathes of boreal forest down to get at this bitumen filled sand that's under the surface. You know, we are knackering the natural environments on this planet at an alarming rate. And, you know, we can do it increasingly efficiently because we've got all this machinery and yeah. has it, technology. Has it passed the point of no return? I don't think so. Does no, it, I don't you, think so. You hear a lot of companies still replanting trees, and, and but I know it's going to take. A long time for these trees to recover, but it's just, I'm is I'm a bit shown? I'm a bit cynical. So there's two things. Like right? I think any you know large companies that like to try and seem more environmentally friendly have often got very good PR departments, mm. and they like to greenwash things. It's like if you if you so for example um, BP right, and I'm not some like anti corporate you know like. Yeah. I'm not going to get on my, you know, right on high horse here or anything, but it's just, a, it's just a fact. If you look at somebody like BP, a company like BP, mm. if you look at the amount of money that they spend on R and D into alternate energies versus oil and gas extraction, so whatever percentage it is, yeah, it's quite small. Yeah, and then if you look at the amount of the percentage of their marketing budget that they assign to making them seem like they spend a lot of time on those things. It's disproportionate yeah. wow. um, because they, you know, so I don't think I need to explain what's going on there. They're, no, no, you definitely don't. They're just trying to, they're trying to cover up wait, a bad history of the BP. I mean, the oil spills, yeah, what they've like, done. Exactly. The, like, the, the, the stuff they got charged for, um, what, that was a very famous oil spill where they even, the whole chairman came on the TV. Well, yeah, to talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the you know that was a Gulf of Mexico, I think, wasn't it? The, yeah, the, yeah. Um, and there's been lots billions of billions and billions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, fund. no. Sure, and and you know they've they've sort of paid the price for that. Um, but the, but they, just using them as an example that everyone knows as a company that you know there there is a skewing of the way that these companies are trying to be perceived, mm. and it, and. You know, okay, you could you could give them benefit of the doubt and say, well, we're trying to emphasize the good things that we're doing. You know, um, but equally, yeah, I mean, with things like the, the oil sands um, in Alberta and various other places in Canada, they're saying, oh, well, we can remove, you know, we can chop all these trees down and we can remove this layer of, you know, bitumen filled uh, t- sand and we can remove the oil from it and then we can 
put it back and we can replant it and it'll be all the same and it, it won't you know mm. how how can it be you know how can it be the same i mean it isn't just it isn't just a bunch of trees and i think that's the problem that mm. people see oh, it's a bunch of trees we can plant trees again if you go into a planted you know conifer plantation in the uk you know sitka spruce or uh, norway spruce or you know lodgepole pines or any of these kind of uh, douglas firs don't get planted as much but you know these these species that have been planted in the past it's just a complete monoculture mm. um and okay, they're planted for forestry, so they're planted close together to maximise yield. But it's not the same as a natural environment. You've only just contain- got to go in the woods. I mean, you will know this yourself, but if I go in the woods a lot, you can go in the woods and there's a complete difference in the whole ecology of like the plants, the insects that are there, even the sounds, the smells. Yeah. Everything's completely different from a man-made exactly. made, uh, wood to yeah. something that's more natural. Indeed. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you, you go up to Scotland and you go to... part. There's, there's a few remnants of proper caledonian pine forest left in scotland so there's some near um not far from aviemore for example and you go into the you go into the forest there and it's full of caledonian pine trees and one of the things you notice straight away is that you've got everything from little saplings to these grand old big you know men of the forest Mm -hmm. you know and everything in between was if you go into something that's planted yeah everything was planted at the same time yeah. All the trees are the same age. They're all the same height. Everything on the understory is at the same level of getting the same amount of light. It's the same level of um, same level of development in terms of what's going on with the rest of the ecology. You don't get that diversity of different sizes, different amounts of light in different places, allowing different plants, which then support different insects, which support different um, bird species, etc., etc., etc. So, so if you, yes, you can cut a bunch of trees down and you can replant those species there. But how long does it take before you get that variation? You know, mm-hmm. you, 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 you. If you, if you, if you clear cut a forest and then replant it with the same species, it doesn't turn out the same as it was before you, before yeah. you cut it down. And and this is one of the lies that we're being told. I mean, ultimately, will it end up being? Um, you know, back where it was, probably because you get some, again, it goes back to natural selection. Some trees survive, some don't, some fall over, some survive to maturity, some don't, that that gives space for smaller ones to seed. And over time you get this variation with, Mm. but only if people leave it alone. And you're asking if it's too, if it's too, if things are too late. What I think is really interesting is, you know, the question I think to ask would be, what would happen if we all disappeared right now like planet if all, would if all, thrive well if all humans just disappeared if, we, if they all just evaporated by tomorrow morning what would happen and i think the the time when you say it would just be a barren wasteland even if we disappeared that's when it's too late mm. if it wouldn't come back if, if nature wouldn't take the planet back yeah if we disappeared that's the point of no return and yeah. what's really interesting is that like you remember chernobyl in the 1980s yeah yeah, yeah. If you have you seen those films where because it you know no people were allowed in there because of the radiation it was just left you know around the plant have you seen the films of how yeah, much nature is there how it's just completely yeah. regrown completely returned yeah and of course that there will be some issues with you know radiation you know maybe causing mutations in some animals and you know the, the you know clearly there's it's not a cost free thing but it's just a really interesting accidental experiment that we've removed all the people from this place where they were having a clear effect and mm. what what does nature do well it just takes it back so i'm seeing there's a car it's beautiful though isn't it it's somebody, beautiful somebody somebody called, just... i can't remember who it was someone it was like a comedian it's not yours. <laughs> it was a comedian or something like that it might be george carlner bill hicks or something like that and he says like he says all these problems about pollution and global warming and stuff like that he says you know what we do he says how we solve all these problems he said just get rid of the bloody humans we're the problem mm. <laughs> <laughs> it is true though but before um when you that i've remembered my question now i was going to ask the question of if we sort of if if human if human beings or more human beings started becoming more in touch with the natural world and started understanding the the fundamentals of of life in general like bushcraft and survival and what goes into growing foods what grows into hunting foods do you think that education of that would actually create a new lens and then it would actually make people's day-to-day actions actually more sort of what's the word i'm looking for more better basically better Mm. well i think i think people it's it's really interesting because you know if i if i take a bunch of people into the forest and 
um, we start looking at maybe some uh, we we do a, we do a tree and plant walk. Let's just keep it. You know, we're going to go around and look at some trees and plants, and I'm going to talk to you about what we might use them for and what they're useful for. Mm. So we're not even really going to get into how we might do that. Yeah. We're just going to talk about you know just sort of we'll lay the groundwork of like let's just go and start to be able to identify some different yeah. tree species, identify some common um, woodland plants. Um, some things you might find growing around field margins and we'll start talking about you know native species that would be useful what's really interesting as soon as you particularly with the the forest floor plants and some of the grassland plants and you know things that you find around the forest margins as soon as you start pointing out well this is this is a, a good you know salad plant this is something that produces seeds that we can eat this is, you know, have a taste of this. Well, that's that's, you know, that tastes nice. You know, have it, have have a look, a taste of some of these berries. Mm. Now, this is a good medicinal, you know, plant. Um, you know, it's good if you've got coughs and cold. This makes a nice tea, particularly if you combine it with this. All of a sudden, people go from standing all over everything to taking real care where they step. Oh. You know, because they suddenly start. They don't just see a bunch of green stuff. And remember, we've grown up in a. In, in a society, in an environment where generally we're allowed to walk on green stuff. We're running around on the football field at school or the rugby field mm. or whatever. It's grass. and But there's other stuff in there as well. There's clover and there's sorrel and there's other things often in fields. You know, we run around, you know, we um, walk around on the grass at parks. And the green stuff on the ground is like carpet. You know, that's yeah. kind of the way yeah. that we're Car- brought yeah, up. <laughs> and then once you start pointing out that all that green stuff isn't the same... And some of it's really useful. Some of it's food. Oh. You're not walking on the carpet anymore. You're walking on your salad. You're walking on your medicine cabinet. You're walking on, you know, and then it changes people's views immediately. And you see that within the space of half a day of how people treat the environment that they're in. They start saying, not walking all over stuff and being careful about where they place their feet. And they start respecting it more and they, va- they immediately value it more. Yeah. And so that's just a very instantaneous example of of the value of just showing people the usefulness of these things. It, it stopped becoming just a bunch of stuff. That's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Do you do you think in general that um, modern day society is trying to sort of shape us against our natural instincts? Well, it's it's an interesting question. I think you know. Good question. Yeah. What, whether you know. You, you could even ask a more a deeper question: Has modern society got a has modern society got to the point where it has a life of its own? Like there is a kind of... That's a good you know, question, by the way. You know. <laughs> yeah, answer that one. <laughs> no, I'm just asking question. the question. Um, but is it trying to shape us? Um, I think it, it, it does shape us. Mm-hmm. You know, I think you, you, you are shaped by your upbringing and your environment in terms of your perceptions of the world, your, your views of different aspects of the world. Um, and, you know, you see that even within a city, you know, you know, even, you know, I don't know, Newcastle, which isn't far up the road, you know, kids who grow up in a relatively well off area versus kids who grow up in a deprived area, their attitude to life is going to be very different. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Um, and so you don't need much of a change and because that isn't really that much of a change. You're not take you're not taking them that far. You know, those two ways of living are not too dissimilar. You know, you're not you know, making them live in a completely different environment with yeah. completely different culture. It, it's, it's, they're quite, quite similar. So mm. even small differences make a big difference to how you view the world and how you orient yourself to other people and uh, nature and everything else you might come across. So, yeah, I, I think absolutely it, you, you can't, I, I think it's, it's, it would be impossible to argue that modern society doesn't shape people to be something different to what they would be if they if they were living a a more simple life i mean i just i just don't think you know but some of those things are probably beneficial you know i think we i think we can we can sort of sit and argue you you can sort of start from the premise that everything about modern society is bad and everything about the past is good um but there are some you know the fact that we're having these conversations now yeah is good um you know the fact that um we're not all dying of tb or you know any of these other things that people had to suffer with in the past Mm. i think is good the fact that you can actually get clean drinking water isn't a bad thing um 
How clean's the question? <laughs> well, yeah, how clean's the question? Um, it, it's interesting, though. I was listening to a podcast the other day, um, and they were doing a book review of a, uh, a diary that was written by um, a guy who fought in the Napoleonic Wars, and he was a sort of a German, basically, but it was sort of seconded into the uh, French military and, and fought in the campaigns against the Russians yeah. in, in the Napoleonic Wars. And one of the things in that was um, that the only water they had to drink was water that they, they could find. And the only water that was there was in ditches that were full of dead bodies and dead horses. That's, yeah. You know, and that was, you know, not that long ago that that was, that was what even sold, you know, like these soldiers who were campaigning, you know, they didn't have any means of purifying water. And it was either die of dehydration or drink ditch water with dead horses and dead people in it. Yeah. Um, you know, and if, and if you think about even a couple of hundred years ago in most cities that didn't have proper sewers, didn't have running water, um, life was very, very different. So, yeah. you know, there, I, I agree with you, you know, what's in the water, how clean is it? Um, mm. I'm more concerned about the chemicals in it. Yeah, definitely. Then, I, you know, I think a little bit of bacteria now and again and you know this is another thing about modern society are we and going back to the previous conversation we had about um whether or not we're we're making things too safe and making ourselves softer yeah you know mm. we have this rise of everything from an increase in, seeming increased incidence of asthma increased allergies all these inflammatory diseases and um, but equally we've got clean you know, we've got clean drinking water, yeah, we've like got balance, clean houses, you know, we've got, you know, so what, what, what's going on is, you know, there's even some, you know, I was reading some papers the other day about how there's research going into how some intestinal parasites actually relieve the symptoms of things like Crohn's disease, you know, that, so there's all of these kind of inflammatory diseases, which they could be in part caused by our lack of exposure to nature yeah, in, well, you know, in different respects. And don't forget, you know, that there are some aspects of nature which are not going to be particularly good for us. You know, like, you know, there's a, there's a lot of nasty um, parasites and uh, things out there, which if you don't, you know, if you don't avoid them, then you, you know, you don't want liver flukes, for example. You don't want amoebic yeah, yeah. dysentery. You know, there's lots of things out there in nature which are natural, but they're not going to do you any good. And, you know, there's plenty of poisonous fungi out there. There's plenty of poisonous plants. So, again, it goes back, you know, some of that goes back to knowledge. Mm. Um, and some of it goes back to, you know, there are, there are pros and cons. You know, we, we're, 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 um, we're sort of taken away from a lot of those risks by the way that we live in the first world. But equally, there's likely to be some downsides to that yeah. as well. And, mm. and the, there's a balance on an individual basis. There's a, there's a balance there. And I think it's interesting sort of going back to what you were trying to get to before. I think a, there are a lot of people who are interested in bushcraft. And I guess on, on the more extreme end, you know, there are people who are interested in, in sort of prepping and, and, and various different aspects. Um, and you could even say, you know, people who are interested in things like reenactment. You know, there's there's a kind of harking back to a different era yeah, or to is. an era or or looking to a time when society wasn't or might not be in the future. I think the preppers are looking forwards and other people are maybe looking backwards yeah. <laughs> um, when that society isn't there and, and things are different or things were different. And um, it's interesting that that's kind of bubbling up to the surface now as we become more removed from our natural environment people are sort of thinking well what does that mean you know you you guys are asking the question yeah. what does that mean that we're that we're being more removed from our natural environment um what does it mean for us as a population what does it mean for us as an individual what does it mean for us physiologically what does it mean for us um psychologically and even in terms of the you know the physiological makeup of our brain as we, we yeah. talked about it you know and so, you know, I think if we go back to the bushcraft thing, I think there is, there, there's, there are clear sort of therapeutic benefits on 
several levels of just getting out into nature and interacting with it and bushcraft is one way of doing that it's not the only way of doing that but yeah. mm -hmm. you know as a modern person to go to the woods or to go to the mountains or to go on a wilderness trip and you know not just go in some sort of bubble you know where you actually go and you're interacting yeah. and you're foraging and you're um you're drinking the water and you're you know you're actually becoming even in a small way part of the environment and you're learning about what you can use for medicines and you know even using some of those things you know if you've got an upset stomach you know make some get some wild mint and make a tea you know if you've got a an infected cut get some you know sap yeah. from a tree that has got some natural um anti antibacterial action and anti-inflammatory action and put that on there just starting to learn those things you know there's there's oh. You know, there's a reconnection there, so there's sort of a high level sort of, you know, re reconnection on a very sort of conscious level, but then there's also reconnection in terms of actual sort of biology, and you know, you're 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 giving yourself access to yeah. different, um, you know, bacteria, and you you know, then there's the whole beneficial benefit of looking at the looking at the green stuff, which even if you look at pictures, apparently yeah, is good for you. So if you're actually out in it yeah and you know you've got sun on your face and one of the other things i haven't we haven't got onto at all but you know something that i notice one of the differences i notice most between me as a person at home living in a house this is what i was just going to ask you actually, and me and a person that. outdoors on a trip or just living and working outdoors so when i'm teaching courses i'm living outside i'm sleeping under a tarp or in a mm. in a sort of tp type tent or what you know i'm not going back to a house every evening or go, even going back to a cabin. I'm yeah. just living and sleeping and eating outside. And um, one of the things I've noticed massively is how my kind of daily cycle changes. Like, you know, and particularly towards the end of the summer. So in the middle of the summer, you know, you've, you're up, you know, you're quite, you know, it's, it's light late and you're up, you're happy to be up late. But as the days start drawing in, you really notice how you want to start to go to bed earlier. Um, you, you're sort of, you're drawn to the fire more, but does that rhythm of your daily life and then... In, like the internal cycles. That's yeah, what sort you, of and like, you, you know, like, so for example, I was working up in Scotland recently and, you know, towards the end of that period of working up in Scotland, you know, it was getting dark. Um, it was getting dark around five o'clock. It was getting light around seven in the morning. And you don't need an alarm clock to wake up at seven, you know, and it's not, you know, and it isn't just birds, singing. you know, there aren't a lot of birds around. Most of them are starting to fly south, you know, and there's not a lot of, you know, it's not like the spring in the woods where it's just an absolute cacophony at dawn sort of thing. It's, it, it's just that your, you, you, you know, your melatonin levels and things are naturally, are naturally changing. There's not a lot of artificial light. Even if you're up in the evenings, you're only around a campfire, um, and you you start to feel drowsy, and I remember saying to one of the guys, it's like it's only I think it was like half past nine or something. I say it's only half past nine, but it feels like three o'clock in the morning. And it's like yeah, it does. You know, we were having a little whiskey around the fire, and yeah. I said, we were just chatting. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, as you do, and um, you know, we were just I say it feels like three o'clock in the morning. We hadn't, you know, we literally had just like a little. He he just said, I do fancy a little tot, and I was like yeah, I'll have a little a little one before I go to bed. I said, but it does feel like three o'clock in the morning, and we looked at yeah. watches, and it was like. Was Half nine. Yeah. No, 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 no. So just to just to, to be completely ambiguous, it was nothing to do with the whiskey. It was just the fact that we were commenting on how late it seemed, mm. but it was only half past nine because it had been dark for four hours. Yeah. Well, you look outside now. I mean, because we're in like an, a very well lit room, yeah. you sort of your your mind actually plays the trick that you are living in a daylight scenario. Yeah. So that's why when people look at the phones and now they have to have a blue light filter yes. because they're not put themselves. In a like a ready state of sleep because the the minds are already believing that it's daylight. Yeah, yeah. So and it's not it's not it's not just your kind of conscious mind. It is actually your body chemistry. It's, yeah, it's a physiological yeah. adaption from yeah. from the yeah. light. And yeah. we're talking about evolution before. We don't know what that's also doing to our, to our no. bodies as well. No, no. no, in terms of evolution as well. No, we don't, and then we don't even know what it's doing to us on an individual health basis over the course of our lives. You know, and that's the first step in that evolutionary question: Is it making us? You know, is it making us more or less able to survive as a 
as a society? Is it making us more or less able to survive as a, uh, you know, to pass our genes on to the next generation? It's interesting because at the minute, in terms of civilization, we're sort of still in that sort of infant stage sort of thing where we're doing all these changes that's coming down the line of like this this window of time that we've been having all this technology and immersing ourselves in this completely different environment compared to the hunter gatherer times this window is just it's literally tiny compared to that yeah. well here's 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 a maybe a slightly controversial thing to say then it's because, fraud in the fire <laughs> <laughs> because you know we we're, we're kind of there's there's an implicit kind of looking up to hunter-gatherer societies here but hunter-gathering still is dependent upon a certain level of technological advancement yeah yeah one minute percent you know so if if you're using any tools whatsoever if you're um you know if you're using a bow and arrow to, arrow to hunt and you're making fish hooks and cordage and things from natural materials yeah. and you've made some baskets that you're putting food into while you're out on a walk you're using some level of technology, which is you could, you know, some some somebody in hunter gatherer society might have been sat there just like us without the microphones though, saying, "Oh, I don't know about these people. All this modern technology. <laughs> yeah, You've modern. got people wandering around with baskets now, and they're you know they're going to get fat carrying all. They can collect so much food. Yeah. When I was a lad, we used to have to go out and just pick berries off a bush and eat them there and then. But and now be, people they've got pe- this basket technology, yeah. and they people in, <laughs> in thirty years time looking at this conversation and thinking, "Oh God, we I want to be them. Like seeing that we're the hunter gatherers well, with that, the microphones. Well, that, that could Look be them having to be in the same room together." <laughs> telepathic thoughts yeah. <laughs> so, so, but it's an interesting it's an interesting kind of just to throw it out there you know concept that even those s- comparatively simple ways of living mm. like technologically simple are still somewhat reliant on the ability to have a level of technology yeah. the question for me though is how far does that go because it seems to me though that that form of what you're talking about in the past it seems to be that was a more a sim i can't say the word a symbiotic relationship with that natural world like they were more interconnected where the the westernized machine now is just completely just bypassing that and thinking it's something so else. so 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 my question is are we conflating two different things then one is the technology and one is the connectedness with nature. And the, and the, and the follow-on question is, uh, is it possible still to have a high level of technological advancement but be more connected with nature? I definitely think it is. I yeah, feel it that's is. That's the ultimate thing. Can we have ever have the true balance? Yeah, but it may have to, I'm actually sometimes think as well, and this is, it's funny how it comes circle, but this is one of the reasons why I actually started getting into bushcraft. This is one of the reasons how I found you as well mm-hmm. is because I'm at the point where I'm thinking that civilizations have always come and gone mm. they've always not come and gone in a sense but they've always come and then there's been a shift or a catalysm like um an asteroid hit when loads of research of asteroids hit the planet or whatever it is things have always co- come to the human species and populations have dropped and fell and th- everything's always shifted in terms of the g- uh, terms of life so i'm actually thinking that and this is why i got into bushcraft is because i'm always thinking that something hasn't happened for a while and is civilization going to get to a point where it gets to this tipping point we either do sort our shit out which i don't think we're going to do yet or something else comes along and makes us shift our trajectory which i think may be possible and that's what i'm thinking in the future maybe it's going to take something like i hope it doesn't do that but there's a part of us where that does think it's going to be something like that that has to come along and shift the civilization to make us sort of go back in time a, a bit, mm. be more connected, then from that position go, right, well, we can't do this same mistake again. We have to ch- do this, mm. do that. And I mean, maybe that's what I think as well, to go a little deeper. That's mm. what I think ancient cultures in the past might have been trying to tell us, that they were at a point where they got to this cusp, they got too ahead of, the, of themselves, and then something happened to them and maybe that's what the pyramids are, the Mayan pyramids, the ancient pyramids are trying mm. to tell us, and that's going out there and deeper, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think so. Just just to sort of stick on the, the bushcraft track for a second, I, I I think there is real value beyond the kind of personal psychological connection with nature aspect of of learning bushcraft skills i think there's real value in maintaining that knowledge because it doesn't take very long you know you were you were asking before chris about you know could you go out and you know forage and hunt and things um it's actually 
quite you know the the environment aside like uh, even if there was a nice natural environment out there that hadn't been messed around too much by agriculture and whatnot mm -hmm. it's still a a, a a large amount of learning knowing what's edible what's not edible and we have this and that's the, that's just the beginning point you know there are some things like you probably heard of deadly nightshade and you probably heard of death cat mushrooms and you probably you know these things that are very definitely poisonous mm -hmm. like if you eat not very much of these things you're going to die yeah mm -hmm. and so there are those things out there and then there are things out there like you know raspberries and blackberries and things which as far as we know you can eat as many of them as you like okay yeah. if you eat too much fruit you might get a runny tummy or whatever but there's no long-term health problems maybe other than a bit of sugar in your teeth and whatnot but it's just mm -hmm. like there's nothing there's no amount of that chemically that's going to do you in yeah 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 but there's a lot of stuff in the middle as well you know we have this there's a simplistic view that stuff's either poisonous or it's not mm -hmm. yeah and actually there's a lot of stuff in the middle so some things are poisonous at certain times of the year and not others oh, wow. yeah some some plants are either very you know they can be quite toxic in the spring before they flowered because it's a defense mechanism so that they can procreate they mm -hmm. can yeah. live long enough that their flowers can they bloom they can pollinate they can seed etc etc and so their toxicity dies off over time other plants actually build up toxins in their seed pods over time so like a lot of the pea family if you eat them green some of them can be you know quite yeah. fine to eat but if later on they can build up certain toxins, which are not very good for you. So that there's that. So there's a new. There isn't just a. Oh, you can eat that. You can eat that. Sort of bivalent, black and white, safe, not safe thing. There's also a nuanced. Yeah. When yeah, can you like eat? A it? structure towards yeah, your diet. Yeah. Like when can you eat something? When is it safe to eat? How much of it can you eat? Hmm. Um, and then there are some plants that the, the toxins in them are not such that you're going to keel over and die. So um, a lot of plants have certain types of alkaloids in them, which over time damage your liver. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the interesting things about sort of modern investigations of, of plants versus what people used to do. So for example, comfrey used to be used quite a lot for making teas. It used it has various proven medical medicinal properties as well, of course, for, for healing and, and whatnot. But you know, bone knitting and healing. But in terms of it being used as a as a sort of food, um, whether it's tea or whether it's using the tap roots as a starch staple, the alkaloids in there over time damage the tubules in your liver and contribute to liver cancer potentially. But that isn't something that happens immediately. It's something that happens over time. And so in the past, you know, granny dying of liver cancer wouldn't have been connected with the fact that she was eating comfrey. Yeah. Mm. It was just something that happened. And, you know, th there's a real level of knowledge about plants which even modern science in looking at the chemical constituents of plants is still is still uncovering and you know a lot of a lot of things would have been known anecdotally and it would have been passed on from from you know generation to generation like yeah. don't eat this food if you're starving and they wouldn't have known why but modern society modern science has shown that this this plant contains something called thiaminase in it which stops your body from using thiamine properly which means you can't metabolize carbohydrates properly yeah. which means that if you're in a starvation situation and you try and eat carbohydrates when you've been eating this plant you don't get the benefit of the carbs so you're better off not eating this plant and just eating the carbs as and when you find them and so th some of this knowledge would have been passed on through trial and error but it's like the evolutionary thing how many people would have had to have been ill or died or you know had other problems by trial and error to mm. get to that level of knowledge and if you don't pass that knowledge on how many generations does it take for that knowledge to completely disappear yeah. well not very many and so i think mm. one of the you know so the, this knowledge you know not just you know beyond the basic oh you know my mate dave ate these mushrooms and he died you know, Jim ate these mushrooms and he didn't. You kind of know that one's not safe and that one is safe. Mm -hmm. 
at least in, well, the in one is, instance. How many mushrooms is a well, civilization that, do we so, have to eat? Well, exactly. So, <laughs> then, so then there is there's, a mo- there's, there's more a nuance. There's a more nuanced, you know, level of knowledge. You know, so mm. a lot of people just think, oh well, I just need to learn what I can eat and what I can't eat. But the problem is that there's a lot more. There's a lot more to it. Once you get into really surviving and living off the land, there's a lot more to yeah, that. What, and the level what, of knowledge. What I mean is, oh, sorry, is just to reiterate, is I yeah. mean, how many mushrooms, is you, are you using that as a metaphor, how many mushrooms as a technological civilization before we do just crumble, how many mushrooms in the sense of whatever we're doing, do we have to eat before we uh, eat too many mushrooms? Has, yes. And then the civilization just goes, boom. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's an interesting <laughs> question. Yeah. And particularly in terms of, you know, polluting our, polluting our environment, you know, it's like, you know, how much of modern disease is down to modern society, you know, and how much of it is down to, so it goes both ways, doesn't it? It's like how much, how much of modern, say, cardiovascular disease and cancer and all these other things that seem to be prevalent in the developed world are down to the environment that we're living in. In, it, in like in terms of positive additive effects like pollution yeah. mm-hmm. um you know chemicals in our food chemicals in our water chemicals in the air that we breathe etc and how much of that is down to us just not living naturally and getting the right amount of exercise and eating lots of different phytochemicals and yeah. lots of different minerals and micronutrients and things so there's there's a kind of additive of additive destructive effect of modern society and a, and, and there's also a negative kind of reductive having been removed from from nature and it, it's hard to unpick all of that yeah. when you when you were seeing me when we we're talking before about the like sort of like the the comparison of sort of the artificial world versus nature and you you said before about the story about how that when you were in the woods for so long you felt the cycles within your own body and your mind changing and things like that do you with you when you do immerse yourself in nature and then you come back to the modern day world let's say mm. like we'll use that as a context do you ever get to a point where you f- you do feel that tipping point where you you're immersing yourself too much in like an artificial world and you you need a, there's something with inside yourself saying come on you need to go to the woods today do you mm. how do you manage that yeah, balance yeah, no point? no i mean uh, i i find it easier to f- flip backwards and forwards now than i used to but one really dramatic thing i remember was the first time i really properly studied tracking and I went and did it. I did a tracking course, and we'd all week. It was a week long course, and all week we'd, you know, really focused on our using our senses to their utmost. You know, like really, you know, and and a number of diff, lots of different exercises at the beginning, in terms of isolating different senses and exploring the different, you know, tastes and exploring smell and exploring how much we could hear doing lots of observational exercises and then moving on to the the you know the tracking and you know a lot of people have this impression and some of it comes from hollywood movies of what tracking is but ultimately it's just about noticing small changes in the environment you know if some if if a deer's walked through an environment it's going to cause some disturbance and sometimes yes it's a very clear hooved you know cloven hooved footprint and you can see that in some soft sand or mud or what have you but other times and it's the same with people walking through you know it isn't always a nice clear boot print it could just be some bends on the blade of grass it could be a bit of mud that's been transferred from a puddle Mm. onto some onto some leaves or what have you that Mm. that is you know it's some disturbance to the environment which is not normal it could be a leaf that's turned over that's dark green on the surface and there's light green on the underside and it's not normal for the underside to be you know shown pointed upwards but something has moved that aside and it's got caught on something else and it hasn't reverted to its proper normal position so Mm. it's just noticing small changes in the environment is how you pick up on where something's walked where it's sat where it's done anything and then you learn to methodically follow that and differentiate between fresh and old and all those sorts of things but again ultimately it's just about noticing differences and nuances in the environment so you become very focused on small details that you would you weren't otherwise previously aware of Mm. um or at least your brain would have filtered out because we spend a lot of time filtering things out you know what's relevant what's not relevant Hmm. um and, and and it's most noticeable that we do that with listening you know with our hearing you know we can we can be sat in you know there could be 20 other people in this room it would make the recording a nightmare but there could be 20 other people in this room having different conversations and we could still focus 
on this conversation if we mm -hmm. wanted to. We've got that ability to selectively listen mm. to things. But we actually do that all the time. When you're walking down the high street, you don't take in fully every different noise that is going on around you. You kind of close things off. And one of the things when you go to the woods, you kind of have to unlearn that a little bit. You have to sort of move out of that operating system and into a different operating system where you're actually more open to you yeah. know what's that little rustling noise you know okay well it's a robin that's just landed behind me and he's looking for crumbs or whatever because i'm eating my lunch you, you actually start to pick up on really small noises and really small changes and so when i when i did this when i did this tracking course because we've been so intensively looking at small little nuanced elements of the yeah. environment when i when I was traveling home, I had to go through London and I got, so I, I, I remember I got on the train down in, down in the Southeast and, you know, sat on the seat and all the dust, you know, that comes out of the seat, you know, yeah. you know, it was so obvious, you yeah. know, and then the noise coming in, this was back in the day before the, the, the trains ha didn't have windows that you, you could open. So the window, you know, it was summer and the window was open. So the amount of noise just from the train moving, it was incredible because we'd just been in the quiet woods all week and yeah. really focusing on really small noises and things. And you now I got back into London and just the speed at which everything was moving and the noise and the smell and the, you know, the oil from the tracks and everything was just really pungent and noticeable. Mm -hmm. And um, because we'd been tuning into more subtle things in the woods and, and at a more natural pace and i think for me that was the that was the time it was most stark mm. that switch yeah the I mean, it was the quite buttons. rapid because it was like you know two hours before i was you know on a quiet country platform and then i was in the midst of one of the busiest cities in the world and you know yeah. but it was just it was really stark that that you know how different a world it was yeah the switch of the buttons yeah. I, I find that I, I find it so just hard just go on the toilet gentlemen oh, couldn't hold this any longer there. <laughs> I, I find it so hard in, in, in my own life um, we'll, we'll bring it around soon we've been going for nearly two hours now already are we already but um, wow. I feel that that switch and that balance in, in my own life as well of, of the contrast between when I'm, I'm in the woods and that's why I asked you the question because I think it, it's it's so hard when you do immerse yourself in a situation I mean wherever you go in the, if you go to the woods or even if you just go for a hike to the like I like to go to the Lake District, which is in the UK, and after I've come back from there, you feel this sort of in sort of instinctual pull that the environment that you've come from is better than the one that you're going into. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I mean, I don't know what it is. I mean, there's like a lot of philosophers talk about how the concept of that of that the technological world is of is still nature anyway because we are nature and we are of nature. But there's still something that with inside me being which i don't know if you're similar that still feels that that's just not right still yeah i mean absolutely i think i think it goes it sort of speaks to our history you know i think we as a as a as a as an animal we've had a a very similar relationship with nature for a long 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 time yeah and very 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 recently it's changed and it's changed rapidly and it it's changing exponentially quickly and it's the ability to deal with that that i think we're confronting um and yeah so i would on a personal level i completely agree if i'm out in the hills and i've got you know a, a stiff breeze bringing me fresh air and i'm filling my lungs with that and i'm you know, walking and, you know, I'm exercising the body and that feels very, very different to being, you know, just walking around a park, in, even yeah. a park in town, never mind the streets of a town, you know, the lack of pollution, the lack of distraction as yeah, well. I mean, I think I think a lot of the problems, of, and I think it's, it's why, you know, meditation has become increasingly interesting for people is that we are very distracted. Um, it's partly the technology, but it's also the techniques of marketing. You know, it's very difficult to go anywhere. You know, it's every side, side of every bus, you know, every toilet wall you go flush, to. Flush, flush. Yeah, you go mm. to, you go to, you know, you go to the toilet in a pub, you know, adverts in everything, front of you. Everything wants your attention. Everything wants your attention all of the time. And anywhere where your attention might not be um, 
grabbed marketers are looking for somewhere where they can grab your attention at, at that point you know and we see it even within the social media that we use um you see it all of a sudden there are ads in your news feed and all of a sudden there are ads within your messaging app and you know they just wherever they can try and grab a little bit of your attention and i think we're constantly battling that and mm. i think those of us that aren't completely dulled in the brain one of our reactions to that and it's a natural reaction is to want to kind of get away from that at least for a while just yeah. to kind of reset it's funny because in nature there's no ad there's, like if you go in nature there's no advertisements yeah. but like we but if at the end of the day like advertisements are trying to draw us in but nature doesn't even require us like nature at the end of the day nature's like sort of we we require nature but we don't require advertisements <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah i mean uh, I mean, there's still plenty to see. There's still plenty to hold your attention in nature. You know, going back to the tracking, you know, if you're it's a different form of communication. It, yeah, and I think it's a, but I think that's that's the that's the parallel with meditation that it's a sort of soft, it's a focus, but it's a soft focus. Whereas a lot of what we do in modern society, like if you're on a word processor for four hours, it's kind of quite a sharp. Yeah. intensive sort of focus even if you actually manage to stay focused on i don't know writing an article or doing a piece of work or what have you and avoid those attention seeking things and but even even that i think a lot of people struggle with now because there's phones going off and mm. like personally i people complain that i'm really difficult to get hold of on the phone yeah, and i, I always have been i hate phones i hate i no i I like speaking to people on the phone. I like speaking to people, but I hate the fact that it can just jump into whatever I'm doing at the time. Yeah. And if I'm if I'm sat in a quiet room reading a nice book, the fact that the phone can ring. I, 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 I really don't like it. And um and so I think, you know, some of us are probably more sensitive to being interrupted. Yeah. yeah than others and i don't know maybe that's that's part of it that we mm -hmm. want that continuity that you get when you're out in nature there's the quietness yeah, i know what you mean because yeah. I, I feel that because i think that's why a lot of people don't want to go to nature because nature's not about that nature's not hurried and for me nature is that that moment of where you forget about your mobile phone but um there's this like sort of with a, with a mobile phone sort of say is that when you've got your mobile phone you're always thinking about the next thing like you can't be within when you're in nature you're present you're completely present in that moment mm -hmm. but your mobile phone's constantly there thinking i can't just i can't just be doing the thing that i'm doing now it's always mm -hmm. constantly interrupting the, the 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 moment that you've got now and yeah. that that really pays yeah. me off all no, the I, time. I, and i and i really it's interesting because i i really like you know doing a two-week canoe trip in canada for example um once you get a couple of days in all of that sort of peels away you know that thought of checking i mean i i don't tend to check my phone a lot but mm. you know equally you know i'm not I, i'm not going to be hypocritical about this i use the technology that we have you know the fact that you found me for this yeah, course, podcast course. is because i've got an online presence i i produce a podcast i have a website i have an instagram account people find me in different ways and one of the things i have to consciously fight against is getting sucked into that easy little loop of i've posted something that's useful to other people yeah which i feel like is a worthwhile activity that i'm sharing something from my perspective from my experience yeah. that's useful to other people but it's then very you have to really be conscious of oh i'll just check and see how many likes it's got yeah. or i'll just check and see if that's <laughs> or you can even there's that validation needed it's isn't a there? validation and it's all you could even dress it up with like sort of pseudo kind of oh i'll just i'll just check you know just anecdotally if if that strategy is working of sharing that type yeah, of content it's yeah. no what you really you just want that little endorphin hit to like to validate to vindicate right. you and and i think it's very easy to get sucked into that portal that little portal <laughs> and it's but it equally it's not even good for the work that you do you know if, if you're if you're adding value to other people's lives like so for example we've had this conversation now for two hours or so yeah if every five minutes we all we just sort of stopped and we're like, actually, I'm not interested in you. I'm just going to get my phone out. It's like, how, how interesting a podcast would that be? Yeah. Probably not. Very Probably not for you guys. It would be rude, um, you know. But equally, it wouldn't be very interesting for anybody watching or listening. Mm. Um, so, 
the fact that we can focus on producing something of value is in the long run more valuable than as just sort of stopping and sort of being yeah. distracted for five minutes while we're doing it and it's the same it, it's easier to do when we're working collaboratively like we are here to produce something it's harder to, to not have the distractions you know like if i was working on a a piece of work myself like writing an article or doing a blog or even you know researching something yeah. for an, a podcast interview it's harder not to kind of I'll just check my facebook account yeah. just check. Yeah. and so you really have to consciously that's a, avoid that, that. that's why I, that's why i love these conversations though because this conversation in general is sort of like when when do you ever get a more that's what i know like in this podcast i've said a lot of bad things about what the future <laughs> but what i do like about this times now is that we can set up a conversation where you live in another part of the uk where you can come to my house you can sit on my couch yes and we can have this focused conversation without you sort of having this half-hearted conversation yes. sort of see where you get your phone out and you're looking at it. This this moment now, is it's really focused and you know people's listening as well, mm. so it even mm. forces your mind to work harder. But it's a beautiful thing to be able to just do yeah, this. it is. And that's what, that's, sorry to interrupt, oh, no, that's one of the things I really like about podcasts in general is that, yeah. you know, unlike a lot of other media that's being produced now, I think this is, and it's fascinating actually because even TV has got, TV got, dumbed down and dumbed down and dumbed down and reality tv and it got dumber and dumber and dumber news got more and more superficial and yet we've got this explosion of long form content in really interesting niches um largely in the form of audio i mean some some video content you know is is getting you know it used to be a few years ago yeah. oh, you know youtube videos let's you know you should only produce stuff that's between three and five minutes or three and eight minutes or whatever it was because of people's limited attention span mm -hmm. but even so there's, there's people in the outdoor space who are producing videos that are an hour long an hour and a half long and people are watching yeah, them but, uh, and, and equally we're we're producing you know i produce a podcast you guys produce a podcast people are listening for an hour two hours and the, okay they might not listen all in one sitting but they're listening maybe for an hour on the way to work and an hour on the way to on the mm, way home from deep work craving, that's why there's yeah, a deep craving just there like is. The craving for nature yeah. there's a there's a craving for yeah. it yeah. I, I think ultimately probably to bring us to an end but um <laughs> would be we just got started yeah, <laughs> this is the first part of everyone. <laughs> We've hardly talked about bushcraft really. Well, but... <laughs> uh, <laughs> Couple but, um, of little forays into it here and I there. I think what it is, it comes down to, and I think I, I found this a lot because I've loved through meditation, but just enjoy the present moment. Mm. Just literally enjoy it because you don't know what you've got, you don't know how long you've got. Just honestly make the most of it. Whether you're in nature, whether you're in just sitting in the house with a friend, or just sitting having a beer or a whiskey, just live it up. Yeah. Just enjoy that moment. Yeah. I think, it. I think being in the present moment. And I actually think one of the things I used to find, I used to do, I'd like to get back to the martial arts. I haven't done so much in recent years. But one of the things I found with training in jiu-jitsu and, and kung fu, which I did for many years, was that, you know, you can finish work, go to a training session for two hours, and you kind of come out the other end sort of mentally cleansed because for that two hours you've been totally focused on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. you know it's a physical activity as well which has got benefits but it's just like you, you, you're not thinking about yeah. all the office politics or whatever it was that you just had to deal with during the day you're not worrying about what you're having for tea you're not worrying about your shopping list because you get punched in the face or you're going to hurt yourself or you're going to hurt somebody else or you're not going to hear what instructions you've been given you have to be focused on what you're doing and you be and that that was a real night it's almost like a kind of waking sort of meditation that you're focusing on doing one thing and i think that's kind of one of the benefits if you can same with you know paddling you know going canoeing for the day you know if you're paddling down a river for the day you're focusing on what you're doing you yes you are being distracted in sort of air quotes by the trees and the plants and oh there's an eagle or there's a, an otter or you know like uh, paddling down the tees the other day and we saw a mink and it's a non-native species and yes they eat the fish and they can damage fisheries and stuff but it's a beautiful creature, you know, yeah. and it's there on the bank and it's curious about us, you know, beautiful little, you know, eyes and shiny coat with a little white, you know, chest markings. And, you know, it's a distraction from the canoeing, but it, it's it's an interaction with the natural world. And it's a it's a it's a it's a 
a it's an enjoyment of that present, present well. it's still yeah. an enjoyment of that present moment and i think that's one of the things that you get from just going out and enjoying the natural world is that it View on, the the, view on the subtle, subtleties of life. Yeah, yeah. But the, 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 the nature of doing things out in the physical world. I mean, you could probably argue you get the same from skateboarding in a skate park, that you have you to focus really. on what you're doing because you really otherwise do. you're going to hurt yourself and you're not going to get the most out of what you're doing. But that naturally comes very easily when you're out for, you know, you're out for a walk in nature. I mean, they say that, you know, a lot of, you know, poets and authors get their best inspiration when they're walking. And okay, part of it's probably being in nature, but part of it is just that folk, is, is that soft focus on an activity that isn't distracting, you know, and isn't chopped up into lots of different pieces, you know, I think. And so I think if you can go out and do activities in nature and you can learn more about nature, then you've, you've got lots of different benefits rolled into one there. Yeah, I love yeah. that. Yeah. Wrap it up there. Great podcast, yeah, by the way. Yeah, Thanks, Thank Paul. you. Thanks Great so podcast. much. Thank you. Yeah, cheers. <laughs> Thank you.